this month's episode of the S Word, a podcast about suicide prevention. I'm Andrew Schramm, and I'm an assistant professor at the Medical College of Wisconsin in the Department of Trauma and Acute Care Surgery. And I have a guest co-host today, JC. Hi, uh, yeah, I'm JC Kant. I am a research program coordinator in the Division of Suicide Prevention uh, at the Medical College of Wisconsin, which is within the Comprehensive Injury Center. Good to be here. Yeah, thank you for joining us. And uh, we'll look forward next month. Uh, Dr. Kolbeck will be back. So excited uh, to have her back. Uh, before I introduce our guest, who I'm really excited uh, has joined us, I want to just uh, remind our listeners that we'll be uh, talking about suicide prevention and issues around suicide in the podcast. And so want you to be aware of that. And if uh, you're not in a space for that, we will be here uh, in the future if you are. If uh, you or someone you're concerned about is in crisis, you can dial 988 or text 988. And for our listeners in uh, Milwaukee, the local crisis hotline is 414-257-7222. So with that being out there, I'm, uh, as I said, excited for uh, our guest today, Lisa Wexler. Uh, Hi, Lisa. Thank you for joining us. Hi, good to be here. Uh, So Lisa is a professor at the University of Michigan, and um, JC and I uh, had the opportunity to meet her at the American Association of Suicidology conference that was in Portland recently, and um, I'm really interested in the work she's doing and excited to have our listeners learn about it. So her current projects include the Family Safety Net to reduce quick access to lethal means in homes, PC CARES, which stands for Promoting Community Conversations about Research to End Suicide, and the Alaska Native Community Resilience Study, which focuses on community strengths to prevent suicide among youth. Um, So again, Lisa, thanks for, for being here. I guess to to get our conversation started, I'm curious to hear a bit about um, your journey to the this work that you're doing now and how you got interested in suicide prevention and where you got started with that work. Yeah, good question. Um, so let's see, this goes back to the 1900s. <laughs> <laughs> um, when I was a younger person and was starting my social work career, I literally followed a boyfriend who's now my husband up to Northwest Alaska. And it's a remote and rural region. So there's no roads connecting the villages that I was serving as a social worker. Um, And ended up, all of my on-calls were really, um, my on-call times were focused on answering calls around suicide. So people would, you know, call like you were saying the nine eight eight number, but this is our local, um, our local number. And I would, you know, I was brand new at doing any kind of mental health services work. I had very little training in suicide prevention, and that is not unusual then or now. Mm. Most clinicians get less than four hours of training on suicide prevention, and yet we are the people that everyone calls. So that's an important thing to note. Um, and I, pe- your listeners can't see me, but I'm a cisgender white lady from Florida working in Arctic Alaska with mainly Inupiaq Alaska Native people. Um, and that cultural difference really meant that I didn't understand a lot of what I was hearing, a lot of what I was interacting with when I was working with families who were either in crisis or telling me that they weren't in crisis, but I was understanding, you know, something different. Mm -hmm. Uh, Didn't understand how people talked about distress, how people managed problems or even thought about self and other and family and community and culture um, in the place that I was at. Because my understandings of those things is really shaped by my own cultural experience. So Um, I did understand enough to know I didn't know very much Mm -hmm. Um, and was finding myself in situations where in order to protect the person who might be suicidal at the time, I was taking away their agency. Um, I was making assumptions about what it meant, what they were saying, what it meant. Um, And I wasn't necessarily listening to family members who were telling me, um, 
you know, whatever they were telling me their understandings were, because my job was to make assessments about this very unknowable thing, which is mm-hmm. near term suicide risk. Um, we still don't have great assessments for that. Um, and has been shown in research that, you know, sometimes it's no better than chance um, mm-hmm. to be able to figure out how dangerous this particular situation is in the near term. And that's a really important thing because we're asked to do that as clinicians all the time. And so, you know, I was in this sort of impossible situation. Mm -hmm. And um, often what that meant was I would err on the side of safety. And in the region that I worked, that meant a trooper plane literally would fly out to the village. Again, there's no roads in the region and would sometimes handcuff people who against their will were being sort of kept safe um, in this particular way. And we would fly them to quote unquote hospital jail. That's what people Mm. who have experienced this talk about. And I would try and assess how dangerous the situation was. Um, And I would have about 48 hours to do that. And if I deemed them still at high risk, high near-term risk, so high imminent risk, um, I would send them down to Anchorage, which is 500 air miles away again, um, where someone else not from the culture would assess them and decide how dangerous they were. And if they needed long-term residential facilities, we would send them all the way down states. And sometimes, and I've worked now with many people who have come back from those experiences, we we can therefore take young people out of their culture, out of their family, out of all of those supports and strengths for years at mm-hmm. a time. And so they come back and there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of estrangement from the people and the culture and all of the things that might keep them safe if we were able to do a better job in place. Mm. And so that kind of set me up on a long journey, really, that started in the mid 90s. I did my dissertation starting in 1999, finished in 2005, and have been doing this work really continuously since then. Mm. What have you, uh, learned since then how how do you how do you think about the ways that we should be intervening in these situations as you've grown as a person and provider yeah that's a great question so mostly since really 99 I've been a community organizer and an advocate and a researcher um so I don't do clinical work anymore so I just want to make that really clear Um, So what have I learned? I love that question. um, So one of the things that I'm most clear about is we should be building on strengths and we should be thinking about people in the context and in the relationships that they find most important. Um, So we need to be moving upstream. We need to be thinking before a crisis and doing a myriad of things to sort of prevent or avoid that crisis from happening in the first place. So that's called universal prevention. That's called, um, you know, uh, in ways we can change the environment. We can help families support, in my case, young people, because young people are at highest risk. We can make the environment safer. So we can really put energy into lethal means reduction. And when there's guns in the home, which in in the communities that I work with, guns are really important tools to get food, to protect one's family. And so we can partner with families to be thinking about how can we reduce access to lethal means to make it 15 minutes harder to Mm -hmm. get that means that you have in your mind. You know, we can make it 15 minutes harder to increase the chances of a second thought. And most of the time there is a second thought to increase the time where someone might interrupt that experience and to really recalibrate um, and regulate one's emotions in a way that maybe isn't so intense. And so there are ways, you know, and and it could be that 988 phone call that you just talked about. And that could be in a crisis that can also be when it's beginning to feel 
kind of maybe sort of like a crisis or like it's moving in that direction. Mm -hmm. so I like to talk about it as a warm line instead of a hot line um, because it really is accessible to people when they're just feeling at their wits end, when they don't know who else to talk to. It is an option that's outside of your everyday life, um, you know, where you can just be heard. And sometimes just being heard is enough. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, I think, a general sense of sort of moving upstream, thinking about the ways in which we can engage families and communities in making everything safer and more supportive of mental wellness. So that's a quick answer yeah. to that yeah. question. <laughs> Appreciate yeah, that. and uh, thinking about the work that you are now doing, um, just wanted to ask if you could tell us a little bit more about the Alaska Native Community Resilience Study, what that all consists of. Yeah, so that work is being led by a really strong group of Alaska Native leaders and my co-PIs, which are Stacey Rasmus and Jim Allen. Um, it's it's through the Center for Alaska Native Health Research and it's funded by the National Institutes of Mental Health. And really in that project, we're looking at what communities are doing to respond to basically colonial policies. I might have to back up a little bit and unpack what I'm talking about there. Um, so Alaska Native communities in the last hundred years have experienced really um, profound cultural and social and economic changes. So people who are like my grandparents' age really were living a subsistence lifestyle. Often they were moving where the food was over, you know, the seasons. Um, they were learning, you know, how to, you know, get food, cure food, manage food, store food. Um, stay warm in the Arctic. So that really involved everyone in the family, all of the knowledge and all of the generational understandings for how to do that. It's a very complex thing. And there are ways in which spirituality ties into that. There are ways in which um, family and community protect each other and keep each other safe. So those values are really, really important. And they look really different for the generation that's my age. I'm, you know, 40s, 50s. Um, people that are my age were actually sent to boarding schools. In Alaska, that, that practice didn't stop until the 1970s. So, you know, many of those folks were sent to places where they weren't allowed to speak their language, where they were punished for doing traditional spiritual practices, which are healing and important for sustaining mental wellness and often experience trauma in those spaces. And so there's a lot of um, work that's being done right now to address some of those harms. People talk about it as historical trauma, but it really does live in the people who are alive today. Mm -hmm. And then we have the youngest generation of people who often, whose parents were protecting them and they did not speak the traditional language with them because of their own experiences. Um, and they're growing up and now there's a huge revitalization effort in, you know, there's so many great Alaska native young people who are really striving to find, um, to find their path back into traditional knowledges and cultural practices that were literally taken away in their parents' generation. So in Alaska, and those generational differences are pretty distinct because of the um, the time span that we're in and when you know colonization was happening in the Arctic communities that I work. So there's a lot of undoing. And even now, you know, schools now, and I'm not throwing shade on schools in general, this is part of the curriculum for all quote unquote Americans, but we still are teaching about Columbus and we're still teaching, you know, about many, many things that don't have a lot of relevance or are, you know, could be considered racist notions where we're lauding people who took so much from other people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so we sort of ignore those things and we still center, you know, this hegemonic, you know, white supremacy 
in so many things that we do, including healthcare. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that sort of brings me towards thinking about how we can um, try and decolonize many spaces. So in the Alaska Native Community Resilience Study, we're really trying to ask communities what's happening on a community level to sort of promote cultural identity, to center what's important to you as community members. So the kinds of things that we're asking people are, you know, how do people that are coming to serve your community, like healthcare providers, like teachers, how are they learning about your history, your culture, your community's priorities? And many communities have taken that job onto themselves and the tribes provide a culture camp for people and they make sure that people know that it's really important, you know, to talk to our kids this way, to to teach that way, to invite elders and other cultural leaders into the classroom to help supplement all of the learning and help ground the young people in being proud of who they are. So communities are doing a lot of creative things around how to help their community. And one of the things that we're finding in that study is that governance is really a a two-way street You know, we had governance questions because, again, we're looking at community level protective factors. So we were asking about governance in a lot of different ways, like how does your community decide, you know, about kids programming in the summer? How are, you know, the tribe and the city and the school working together? Those kinds of things. And we found that governing sat in two places when we did... um, you know, confirmatory and exploratory factor analyses, which if people are interested, I don't know if they are. But anyway, um, when we looked at how people were answering the questions that we were asking, we found that they were breaking up into two distinct governing pods, if you will. One was governing responsibly, and that's important. So if we say this is a law, and remember, tribes are nations, so they make rules and people have to follow them. You know, are they following through? So that's governing responsibly. And we asked a lot of questions about that. Most importantly, though, what seems to be driving a lot of our outcomes is governing responsively. So are they including Mm -hmm. elders in decision making? Are different entities within the community working collaboratively to make sure that young people have opportunities, have um, ways that they can be mentored? towards taking leadership in the future, those kinds of things. Listening, are there ways, are you know, community meetings well attended and are what people say taken into consideration and used when making rules around the community? So those kinds of things, that responsiveness, really, really important. So um, those are just a few highlights from that project. Yeah, thank you for telling us about it. Um, I. I'm going to be vulnerable and maybe show my ignorance here. Um, could you tell us a bit about in that colonization, um, like who was doing that, and what, like who, what was the motive to ship people, natives to to boarding schools, for example? Yeah, that's a big question. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, it feels really uh, hard to sort of boil it down to a few yeah. questions uh, or a few answers to that. Um, so there was sort of a, a really dominant idea, and this is true for a lot of indigenous communities um, who have experienced the same thing. So this is the recipe that we've been using in, you know, this colonial path from, you know, from the East Coast Mm -hmm. across the continent and up, Mm -hmm. um, you know, was to sort of um, assimilate the children of Indigenous people so that over time, um, you know, this is sort of a slow burn genocide. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's a way of taking culture away without killing people. So it was a more... um, Uh, you know, I guess, uh, uh, more PC at the time. And this really started 
happening in the late 1800s, where it was more acceptable to just steal children and indoctrinate them mm. and punish them and, you know, offer trauma to them in ways that really have long, long-term consequences. But that wasn't the plan, but it was really, you know, like, save the child, kill the Indian. So it was a way of not brutally assassinating young, you know, vulnerable parts of the community, but it really did, you know, have a intergenerational effect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so the scope of the work you, you described, like moving upstream and as you're describing, like, conversations around governance and empowerment and you know it strikes me just how far upstream that is yeah um, we have some closer uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes we, yeah. we we have gone way upstream and I think it's important so that we're not always asking about risk and again you know, our assessments of near-term risk are not good. And we've been spending so much time trying to identify the most at-risk people at the most risky time. So that crisis, right? Where there's a near-term chance that this person is gonna go on to make a suicide action of some sort. Um, and we haven't had much success with that. So, a lot of the projects you started off with my, our broadest one that's really focused on community strengths and how communities are responding to the harms that colonialism brings now and from the past. So it's an ongoing process of renewal and resistance, really, that communities are involved with in order to bring up their young people as strong, culturally centered human beings. Um, so, so we have gone upstream, but we've really done it with the support and sort of insistence mm. of our Alaska Native partners. Mm. Yeah, um, while you've been talking, I've just kind of been thinking, because um, I am also a white cisgender lady. So just thinking about, you know, what have you learned coming into this culture about working with a different culture and what advice would you give to people who may be coming into a space or a community that they're not a part of or don't know much about? Um, what advice would you give so that they're being helpful rather than harmful with the way that they're trying to work with them? That's a really good question. Um, I mean, the most important thing is to enter into authentic relationships with people where you're also, I mean, I loved the idea of like making yourself vulnerable, Andrew, the, you know, like, and part of that vulnerability is to actually admit, acknowledge that you don't know. Mm -hmm. You've been put in sort of a position of power that was not because you had more to offer than other people. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's a very humbling thing. And so sort of acknowledging that, being willing to, be vulnerable by not knowing and asking for help, asking for advice and reflecting pretty consistently and constantly about how your power position, because often we come in and I'm saying this as like a therapist or a social worker, where we, act, we do have power over people's lives. And we don't think about it that way often. Um, so what we say, what we write, how we advocate for people's needs that they've identified, whether or not it fits in with what we know or don't know, that's really important to sort of take it seriously, try as much as possible to hear what people are saying, to understand it, and to advocate for what they know they need. Because I promise you, people living their lives know a lot more about their lives than, you know, you do or I do. Um, and so I think it's really important to acknowledge and uplift what people are bringing to their own understandings in their own lives. And maybe you can ask questions, maybe you can advocate, maybe you can bring resources to it, but people are usually the best folks to manage their lives, <laughs> right? I mean, that's no matter what culture you're in, that's true. Um, and I think often when, um, 
when we're coming from a dominant culture and working with a more marginalized one, I think we don't even understand all of the privileges that come into that. So if we can begin to identify, you know, that when I'm saying something, people are listening and then I'm noticing when someone else is speaking, maybe they're not heard. And this happens in our systems of care too, and our systems of education, you know, where if you come in with some letters after your name, you're more likely to be heard than someone without those letters. If you speak, I'm going to say proper English, if you speak an English that, um, you know, is more lauded, is, you know, considered, you know, more formal, that, then people are going to listen to you differently. Um, and so it kind of behooves us to be thinking about all of those nuances and to be real advocates for lifting other people's voices into the mix. And if we can gently, um, you know, with as much humility as possible, if we're seeing injustices, try and figure out how to step into the right side of those. So that bystander work, you know, where we're sort of asked to notice and to speak up when we're hearing things that aren't quite right or we're noticing things that are marginalizing some kinds of perspectives or some voices, um, you know, it's really, it, it's on us to figure out how to bring those things out in a way that can be heard. So it's usually not just calling it out, but, um, you know, finding a space and a time to, to have conversations that are uncomfortable, um, but could push towards, um, you know, decolonizing systems that we're in that we know are racist inherently, and to really try and figure out better ways of doing the work that we do want to do. You see, I love the way that you included in that, the, the way you phrased that question included avoiding harm. So like in that question, you're acknowledging that well-intentioned people cause harm um, and these, these systems cause harm. And Lisa, as you were describing your earlier work, I wonder if like that crossed my mind, it, wondering if part of your journey has been kind of reconciling with potentially harm that that you feel you caused or systems that perpetuated that that you were a part of yeah absolutely I mean I think that that's the that's absolutely been a compelling reason to stay involved in this work and to really try and figure out how within the structures that we have in place right now how we can begin to actually try and find and build on and support the strengths of the people that we're working with. So one of the projects that we're doing, it's called the Family Safety Net, really is focused on family strengths. So, you know, many, many people are very familiar with the mandatory screening that we all do for suicide, you know, like the PHQ-2 or the Columbia screen. Well, we find in our community is very few people are screening into those, like very, very few. And it's because they know what the next steps are. Like they know mm -hmm. that they might lose their agency, meaning their ability to decide, you know, where they are, when they are and who they talk to. Um, and so there could be some downsides to that. So one of the things that we're doing is we're um, doing a family focused screening. So we're literally asking, in the last month, has someone in your household seemed sad, down, or depressed? And are you worried that someone in your household is at risk of suicide? And if that person says yes, then we say, are you willing to do a 15 minute conversation with someone here at the clinic? This is in primary care. Um, and you know, we'll send you home with some things to make, you know, to make your home safer and to keep your loved ones safe. And we've had like the vast majority of people say, yes, I am interested in that, very much so. And we talk to them about lethal means reduction and some small things that they can do. We give them magnets with 988. We give them cable and trigger locks and ammo boxes and medication boxes. Um, and we find that people really like this because it's building on something they want to do anyway, which is to keep their loved ones safe. It's giving them tools that they can use right now and the material resources to do it. Mm -hmm. So 
And then they go home and they do it or they have conversations with people about how they can make their home safer, how they can support their loved one in different ways, how they can mystif demystify that warm line, that 988, um, and make a phone call with someone so they can see or make, you know, text that line. So these are really small steps. This is a lot farther down the line on that upstream um, approach, but it's it's a way to build on family strengths when we're working in communities that really do center, com, you know, the, the family unit. And so it's a way to build on what people care about in ways that they care about without downsides. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Um, and I feel like that's really important too, when you're in a space where a population has been mistreated or harmed by systems. Um, it just sounds like a really good way to build trust as someone who is, you know, in that system that has harmed them previously. So I, I really love that you're, you know, building on what is important to them and what is going to, you know, foster connections and I don't know, like save lives in a really meaningful way. Yeah. I just, I just love that. <laughs> yeah. It's a not stigmatized way and it's building yes, alliances, exactly. way, right? Because you're working towards what people think is important already. Yeah. Right. Yeah, for sure. And then I know another study that you have going on is the PP Cares. And I believe that's the one that you use critical pedagogy. So if you could just kind of describe what that is for our listeners, that would be awesome. Yeah. So I could talk about critical pedagogy for a long time. It's basically the idea that, <laughs> that communities have a lot of understanding and power. And if we can tap into that and create a sense of um, movement and learning within communities, they can really change their world. So um, PC CARES stands for Promoting Community Conversations About Research to End Suicide. And it's really built on a Frarian. So for any academics out there, Paolo Freire um, was very much into this critical education idea where um, you bring something to the table that is actionable and that's important to people. And in the communities that I work, youth suicide prevention is extremely important. It is all too common. Everyone has an experience on some level with it. And so people are really motivated to have the conversations about what can be done. So we train local facilitators because it's also really important for local people to be leading the efforts in their own communities for change. And only they know how best to make that happen. So we share a little bite-sized piece of information that's actionable around suicide prevention. Um, so the lethal means example that that you know I shared before, where if you can make it 15 minutes harder to get a loaded gun to take action on your suicidal impulse, you can save lives. That's the bite-sized piece of information. How that works in your community, in your home, I don't know. Mm. But we can spend a lot of time exploring ideas around that. So literally we share a bite-sized piece of information and what does the research show? And then local facilitators facilitate a conversation about what do we think? How does that apply to our lives? How does that apply to our families? You know, what's going on, you know, in the communities that I work, many households have multiple guns for all of the different kinds of hunting that's done um, to feed families. And so how, how might we take this information and put it into practice? And we can have mothers who are thinking about, oh, you know, maybe I want to make sure that my son asks for the keys to get the guns before he goes out hunting so that I know he's in the right headspace to be respectful and responsible with that tool, the firearm. Um, and I can make, you know, I can sort of gatekeep that a little bit. Or we might have people that are really thinking about, um, you know, having prescription meds and they really want to make sure that they're locked up. Whatever it is, it could be conversations that they're having that they hadn't had before. And so we share a little bite-sized piece of information, like 15 minutes can save a life. 
And then people talk about how it might apply to their lives. And then they talk about what they want to do. So every learning circle, and we have a series of five generally, run by local people, where they bring all the local providers, community health workers, social workers, teachers, parents, lots of different people together to learn a little bit from research and then learn a lot from each other mm. and decide what they want to do to take that information into practice, how they want to use it in their lives. And then every subsequent learning circle that they participate in, they hear how people have used the last bit of information. How did it turn out? What And they're learning through that process from each other. So it's really trying to instill a way for community members to learn from research, yes, but really from each other and figure out how they can move forward together or independently to make a difference in the lives of people that they're interacting with. Mm. Oh, that's so cool. Mm -hmm. Lisa, can you think of another example of a bite-sized kind of piece of research that conversation might be centered upon? Yeah, so something that comes to mind, and this is, um, you know, it, talking safely about suicide, many people don't know that there are ways that you can increase mm -hmm. risk when there has been a suicide in your community by how you talk about suicide, that actual event. And so we invite people to think about how they talk about the suicide that happened mm -hmm. in a way that can be protective. So you know, don't talk about the details, those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, don't tell about why you think it happened. Instead, talk about solutions or ways in which that situation might have been different. Mm -hmm. Talk about resources that people could access, just like 988 that we've been talking about. So that's something that we actually cover every time is that mm -hmm. talking safely. Another thing that is very actionable, um, are the caring contacts. So there's been research that have shown that folks who have made a suicide attempt or have suicidal ideation are much more likely to help seek, to find help before they take suicidal action if they're receiving non-demanding caring contacts, or we like to say small acts of kindness. Um, and that non-demanding part is really important. Mm -hmm. So when you say, if you're having a hard time, call me. That's a demand. Mm -hmm. So you're saying in order to get help for me and to feel supported for me, you have to do something. And many times people do not feel, you know, at their best mm -hmm. <laughs> when they most need it, right? So they yeah. can't be reaching out. So that's where the non-demanding comes in. So instead, just sending them a little note that's, I'm thinking about you. I'm glad, you know, you're in my life. Or, you know, giving them a little gift or a little food, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so those non-demanding acts of support can really help people feel less alone. And when they are at their worst moments, they think about the help that they can get because of all those seeds of support that you've offered them through these non-demanding mm -hmm. care. So research has shown that when people receive non-demanding caring contact, they're more likely to seek help before they make a suicidal act. So that's a really important, very actionable thing. We yeah. can all do it with yeah. people in our lives. So that's another example. Very cool. Yeah. I am sad that the time has just flown by here. Yeah. Um, but I, Lisa, one thing that we'd like to ask everyone that I wonder if we might kind of finish on today, if that sounds okay, is... Um, wondering what is something that you wish everyone knew about suicide? Hmm. And another question, I guess, is if, is there anything that like we haven't talked about yet today that you feel might be, feels important to, to touch on? Yeah. Uh, I have so many, Yeah, thoughts, but I have been saying a lot of them. Um, I mean, I think that the thing that frustrates me the most about the suicide prevention world, if you will, mm -hmm. is it focuses in on the, the one really small moment in time when people are at crisis. Mm -hmm. And we act like that's a discernible thing when it's really not even discernible to the people that are acting. Mm. 
And so to me, by making it so narrow and um, really focusing all of our efforts on that one critical moment in people's lives, we've neglected so many other pathways about prevention mm. that we know can improve people's mental wellness, that we know can improve safety, that we know can help family members connect with one another. So all of those things are suicide prevention. And all of those things are way more hopeful than just waiting mm -hmm. until somebody's at critical risk and then intervening in a way that not everybody wants. Mm -hmm. So the, the sort of big picture thing is I, I, there's so many other things that we've made suicide fit into this very small box that doesn't really allow for a lot of creativity, a lot of solutions that come from families and communities. We've made it all very sort of contingent on formal mental health services that are unavailable to most people mm -hmm. in this country and mm -hmm. certainly not easy to get paid for by mm -hmm. all people in this country. So we sort of professionalized it in such a way that, that we boxed so many other players out mm. <laughs> to use a basketball yeah. <laughs> So, um, So really sort of opening it up um, democratizing this work in such a way that it doesn't have to always end in referral to mental health services. Sometimes that's absolutely the right thing to do. Many times there are many other things that could happen well before you get to that point. Yeah. And we're in just, it's just the nascent period of exploration there. Like we really haven't done much work in looking beyond that. Mm. We've looked deeper and deeper and deeper, and it has not done mm -hmm. much good at yeah. that one critical incident moment. And we've neglected all the other moments that came before it and will come after it. And that just seems like such a pity to me. Mm. Yeah. So, you know, mm. like suicide prevention really is future promotion or opportunity promotion, right? We can turn it on its head. We can be thinking about mental wellness. How do we create a more opportunities to move into the future in a way that people are hopeful about? How can we do that? We can do that through relationship. We can do that through experience. We can do that by just offering non-demanding support sometimes. Mm -hmm. Like there are many ways we could do that. And we have sort of made it small so yeah that's the, that's the the one Thank thing you. that i think is most important about mm -hmm. communicating about suicide prevention yeah i love that and uh i i don't know i feel excited as you're describing that uh and, okay. and for, for the potential for us collectively to continue in a in a more holistic direction um I, I wrote down what you said about suicide prevention is really future promotion. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's basic and there's so much to it. Mm -hmm. Both. Um, yeah. And so I just think, you know, how, how many really creative and interested and interesting people are thinking about how we could be doing suicide prevention. If we just open the aperture, yeah. include all, all of what it can be we can actually do it yeah, yeah. <laughs> we need to be thinking about that more now than you know any other time there's been real challenges in this age particularly for young people and so i think we really need to be much more creative about how we go about doing this work well thank you so much lisa wexler for joining us and jc Kant for being my fearless co-host here I really um, appreciate you both and um, encourage our listeners maybe as we as we wrap up this episode to take a moment to pause and just notice uh, how you're feeling about the discussion and if, if this has brought up anything for you, um, encourage you to, to reach out to a supportive contact. So that does it for our August episode of The S Word. And um, again, thank you so much, Lisa, for joining us. It was really a, a pleasure. And uh, we'll uh, see everyone back in September.